so some of the things that we've done with these conversations is just a conversation, just an opportunity for us to talk and talk to would-be faculty mentors and advisors. The, the idea is that thinking, thinking back to maybe the first time that you did this, thinking back to um, uh, being a lifelong learner and probably how you constantly tweak what you do when you work with first year students because first year students today are not the same type of first year students that you had, right? When, when you first started at the college and some of our first interactions with them are, are really important. And there's so much work that we can do and that we do um, that really needs to be tailored to what they, to what they need, right? More than what we want to do. As we start to get along in the second, third, and fourth years, it's usually more of a of a conversation between the faculty and the student, right? We get to talk about, you know, how you want your education to go, what's the right path, how we move forward. But the first year is so different, right? So um, I don't know if you could just, you know, introduce yourself, talk about how long you've been in the college, what departments you work in, and then we just have a few questions and this can just be a conversation between you and me, and then eventually for other people to listen to. Cool. Well, that's one of my favorite things to talk about, so I'm happy to be Great. here. Um, I am Andrea Wren. I am a professor uh, in the English department. Um, my research focus is Victorian literature and digital humanities. Um, but at the college, I teach everything. Um, and that's kind of how Whittier College works. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really teach everything because I also am an associate dean and director of the Whittier Scholars Program, which is an interdisciplinary self-designed uh, curriculum program for students. And we do a lot of mentoring through that program as well. Um, let's see, I've been at Whittier. Actually, Gil and I started just about the same time, I think. We're close, at least. Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> yeah, I think I started in 2007, so that might be a year or two after you. Yeah, I started in 2005, so we're right around the same generation, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> a golden vintage. <laughs> Actually, hopefully not silvering, maybe, in fact. Anyway. Yeah, definitely silvering. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think what you said about students changing is really true, in my experience. Um, I remember my first year at Whittier, um, I thought I was really prepared. I came in, I've taught freshman writing on many times. In the English department, we used to teach freshman writing basically every year, everybody did. Uh-huh. And, um, and uh, we teach writing in general every year for sure. Um, and I thought that was the class I was most prepared for because I did a lot of that teaching as a graduate student um, in, in freshman writing programs at, at my graduate university. Um, but Whittier is a really different place and our students are different and their needs are different. Um, And so actually it was one of the hardest classes for me to teach my first year uh, because I was, I needed to get to know my students in really different ways. Um, And my assumptions about who they are, who they would be and where they were coming from were off because I was basing those on things that I had learned at my graduate institution. Um, And that's just a, a sort of beginning mistake that I made. You know, I needed to figure out who Whittier college students were, who the, 17 or 18 people sitting in my classroom actually were and what they needed from me. Um, and I think that really is, a, is about learning to get to know them and then developing that connection with them. Um, so, I mean, I, there's tons more I can say on that, but um, does that resonate with your No, yeah, that's, that's great. I, I think it helps, um, it helps a new faculty member understand or a, a new a, faculty member who's new to teaching first year writing, maybe working with first year students in this, this particular way. I think it gives them a, a lot of context. And um, mm-hmm. we take this very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary liberal arts approach, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking with a, 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 an incoming first year student's mother today, and she was saying, you know, she was, she was really speaking this very liberal arts talk and and um she's actually a rabbi and and she we were having this really wonderful multidisciplinary conversation and it was just uh it was nice to see a new face 
and to see, uh, to learn a little bit about the type of students that we'll be, you know, we'll be bringing in. So mm -hmm. they're of, of our mindset, right? They want to, they want to bring all these ideas together. So, so this is great. Um, so let, let's elaborate a little bit about your approach to, um, working with first year students in particular. Uh, what do you think have been the most important things when working with first year students? And uh, what are some of the things that you've found to be successful and, and perhaps not as successful? <laughs> and, and, you know, so we can think about context a little bit for a, for a new faculty member or a newer faculty member or a refresher for some of our continuing faculty that are teaching this course again. Yeah. Well, um, I must admit that the things I've done wrong just leap to the front of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm happy Always. to talk about those because I think teaching is an endless lesson in, um, in how to do it better next time. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So, um, you know, giving yourself a, the benefit of the doubt and a little bit of a break as a teacher, I think is really important. And that's something I think we, we do for our faculty colleagues here. Um, but what are some things that I think are really important um, these days for our students right now, um, incoming students, first year students? Um, I, think, uh, I think it's really helpful to help students get to know the campus. Um, to, you know, you were talking, Gil, about that sort of liberal art, multidisciplinary experience. And I, I think another aspect of that is that there's so much more to college than just the classroom. And believe me, the classroom is a really important part, you know, <laughs> but um, I like to give an assignment if I, no matter what kind of first year class I do, I like to give some kind of assignment that, that incentivizes students to get out of the classroom and to interact with other folks on campus. So whether it's attend a, a play, perhaps, um, in the, you know, in the theater department, we do that a lot, or, um, go to the first meeting of a club or a society um, or attend a student government meeting. Um, you know, that'll take a long time on a Monday night. <laughs> um, but there are so many, attend a sports event, you know, just even go to a sports event. Um, anything like that, I think is really helpful because it sort of, I think, you know, liberal arts, it's about the whole person, right? And it's about the whole college experience. And um, so I, I think those kinds of assignments, and they can be very simple, just sort of go to something, reflect on it, and, and maybe that reflection often I find is productive of great conversations, right? Reflect on it in a way that invites other people in the class to, to, get a partic to participate. So in other words, what I guess what I'm saying is don't necessarily think that it has to be a writing assignment. Like maybe the reflection could be, you know, tell us about it you know, or huh. make a two minute um, video on your iPhone, you know, or other phone, whatever Android phone, <laughs> about what you learned. Um, or do a Quizlet that invites your friends to learn about basketball at Whittier College or something. Um, and students tend to find those assignments fun and they get in to participate. They get to be actively involved in learning from each other. I think that's a real bonus here at Whittier. Yeah, if we think about modeling engagement, right, and and how you can kind of situate that as a as an assignment that's not really an assignment. Sometimes students can kind of they 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 become this this active participant in learning, and and you you've not duped them into learning something, but you've encourage them to do something different than they would have maybe chosen to that particular day. So, yeah, I really. Um, I really enjoy those types of opportunities where we can um, just remind them that this is life and it's life at a college. There's different types of engagement than we would otherwise expect to, to uh, partake in. And it's, it's a different type of engagement than they will have after they're done with their college experience. So make yeah. the most out of these opportunities, right? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the most powerful, on that note, one of the most powerful things I ever learned was, um, I learned it from another student. Um, that's so often the case with me. Um, and actually, it's a student who's now gotten her PhD. So I guess this is a few years old. But um, she was a freshman mentor, in, or she was a mentor to the freshmen in my, or to the first year students in my class. And um, she actually did a thing where she talked about attendance in terms of tuition dollars. 
And um, it never would have occurred to me, but she, you know, calculated out, you know, what, what do I pay in tuition and how much am I paying per hour of class time? And, um, and she actually said, you know, so when you miss class at 8 a.m. because you overslept, realize that you're making a, a decision that's worth X hundred dollars. And, oh my gosh, like everybody in the class, and, you know, I'm still connected with a lot of these students, we all remember that, right? Uh -huh. Like it sort of contextualizes those life decisions that people are making, you know, every day, right? Right. Yeah. That's, and that's a, that's really important um, and something that we, no matter how much we want to uh, lay it out like that for the students, it, <laughs> it, it's better heard and absorbed from another student. That, so, so that's another great thing that, that uh, uh, teaching first year students is that, that learning something from one's peers is really important too. And I think mm -hmm. that's a very... Um, a very wittier thing, right? That we allow the and encourage the students to be such a play such an, a meaningful part in one another's education, right? There's this yeah. this peer model, peer mentor, peer tra trajectory that they have right? that they're going to be, um, you know, bringing one another up along the way, and and mm -hmm. that's also a really really uh, important part of our um, the the academic experience that we promote, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's also helpful to students in developing something that I think is really uh, a part of the sort of college age experience, which is developing a kind of agency in their own education. Mm -hmm. So many, I, I see you nodding, Gail, so many of our students, I mean, you know, they're coming from, from high schools that are have been underfunded. I mean, we all know the stories of what's happened with, with education in California. And no matter how good their teachers are, the students may have been sort of become used to being told what to do rather than developing the skills to sort of figure it out for themselves. And I think college is this moment where a lot of them are having to learn to like, hey, I have a, a huge array of choices. How, you know, what do I do with that? You know, what do I do with this huge catalog of classes? How do I even approach it? How do I begin to think about what I, what I like? Um, it's really stressful, of course, because it's also related to, you know, that giant question, what are you going to do with the rest of your life, <laughs> you know? So, um, but it's sort of seeing other students um, as peers that are a step ahead can really help with that. And any kind of practice, I think, that we can give students in sort of determining their own path is really helpful. So let me ask another question. Um, if what advice would you give to a faculty member that is preparing to do this for the first time? Mm -hmm. um, just, just anything. Like, is there a particular sequence of things, uh, some resources that, that you found helpful, or um, maybe a, anything, uh, abandoning your approach, your, your preconceptions to what it is to teach new students. I don't know. Any, any tips, any wisdom that you can impart upon faculty doing this? Um, okay, here's a few things. Um, Great. <laughs> so first of all, um, I would say get some books about pedagogy and read them over the summer. Um, there are some really great books about sort of the quick exercises you can do in the first five minutes of a class, you know, that kind of a thing. And I can send a list of recommendations if that's useful. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, I, I find them really fun. And, you know, they're usually a little lighter reading than, you know, all the stuff I do for my <laughs> research. Um, so, you know, study, because pedagogy is actually work, right? And I, we all know this. But um, it's amazing how much you can learn from just reading or just reading something new that you haven't read before. You know? um, the next thing I would do is, uh, especially if you're a new faculty member here at Whittier, talk to people in your department. Um, ask to see their syllabus. Um, ask them how many pages of, of reading and writing do you assign per week. Um, try to learn from them what are the, the things that they're doing and therefore, what are the things that students might expect to be doing, right? So you can understand whether your, you know, whether your plan is kind of in line with the expectations of other faculty members. And that, that's helpful because students, you know, when they have, five, you know, say five classes, it's helpful to, to be sort of, you know, in the range of what other people are expecting. 
Um, and it's hard to know when you come from different places, right? Um, another thing I would say is front load your syllabus. Um, uh, and by that I mean, I tend to put more reading and, more, and certainly essay assignments do right away. I like to get the first writing assignment in within the first two weeks of class. And that means that I'm having them read probably a novel within the first week of class. We're all, we come to the semester, I mean, hopefully this is true for fall 2020, because <laughs> it's gonna be different, but we come to the semester with energy, right? And then, boy, by the middle of the semester, people tend to be more tired, right? So I tend to reduce the reading load, the weekly reading load as we get later in the semester. Um, so those are a couple of syllabus design things that I would suggest. Um, oh, here's one. Think about, um, as you're planning your classes for yourself, okay. think about um, when your assignments are due for your own sanity. <laughs> so if you're teaching three classes, don't schedule all of your essays, but essays due in every single class on the same day, right? <laughs> so that's a, a kind of just sort of general teaching one. Um, yeah. Those are the hardest habits to break, I think, because we're so used to this uh, this traditional 13 week semester at Whittier College. And um, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard a student just, you, you know, say, is there any way I can turn in this assignment next week for you because I have three other tests or three other projects. Mm -hmm. um, and they just, you know, I don't know if it's because of my approachability or they, they just prioritized a different way. But that's that's really good advice. I I you know I try to spread everything out throughout the whole semester, but there's that natural urge to just build it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and weightier as it goes along. And and you're right for your own sanity. We we're lucky because we get we get to pace our own work a little bit. And I I've encouraged uh, faculty to front load or middle load their their. Uh, big assignments as much as possible, where, where appropriate, because sometimes, you know, final exam is a final exam. You can't avoid right. that, but right. great. Yeah, I think, I think something you said um, reminded me of another thing that I think is uh, yeah. maybe the most important thing for first year students, teaching first year students is to, you know, establish a relationship with each individual student. Uh, and that is, um, that's not all that easy to do sometimes, especially if you've got a class of 25 people, um, but to, to find a way that, um, you know, that they feel comfortable coming to you because they really are going to have all sorts of concerns that we couldn't possibly anticipate um, and that they can't anticipate. And it's really helpful if they can see you as somebody that they can come to and talk about, you know, life stuff. And often that will mean, by the way, and I, I think this is especially true for women faculty and faculty of color, students come to us, I think even more so, um, and um, often with things that are far beyond my training, you know, and what that means is, I think of myself as somebody who can, knows where the counseling center is, or the student health okay. center, or the, you know, office of everything, um, and I can walk them there, you know, um, so I don't have to be an expert, and I very, very comfortable saying I'm not the person to help you with this but I can take you to that person right right and and I think it's um I think that's a a wonderful opportunity for us to talk a little bit about this this role that students really don't understand some of the times is it's um uh, you're their first year faculty mentor right mm -hmm. but you're their academic advisor so they students don't really understand the difference between those two and, and sometimes the faculty don't even understand the difference between those two but the mentor is that real get to know them one-on-one -on -one, right get to be able to provide the advice that is outside of the classroom and then the academic advising really talks or speaks more directly to what they're going to be doing while they're working as a Whittier College student Right. right. I mean, and we, we sometimes lose track of those things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of say, oh, they're both the same thing. And they're they're not really the same thing. They really are two different things. And, uh, yeah. and 
And I think it's important for the faculty to pace themselves because you, you can really blur the lines pretty quickly if you're in a, an advising session that is becoming, uh, you know, I, I need, I need help with all these resources. Well, you let's compartmentalize or prioritize. Yes. Let's get you the help you need outside of the classroom. So then you can be successful in the classroom and then we can follow up with that kind of, you know, catch you up academically or, or point you to the academic resources that you also. Need. So yeah, that's, that. thanks for bringing that up. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. On that, I, I use on my syllabi instead of a, instead of a, a, a bunch of separate statements about certain types of offices, mm -hmm. I have an, a, a statement about an inclusive, inclusive learning environment. And in that I list a whole bunch of um, resources for them, but those are also resources that, you know, I need to, that I try to talk to students individually about in, in individual meetings before they necessarily even say that they indicate that they need it. Um, just because that's also part of learning what their tuition dollars are paying for. Right? That's a good point. That's a good point. If we, if we trace the value of a Whittier College education versus the cost of a Whittier College education, yeah. maybe we can start to help the students think about things a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, because they're, they can actually get more value out of it than they think they can, right? If they, if they take advantage of certain opportunities that present themselves. So that's a, it's a wonderfully, um, I, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderfully liberal arts way to describe the Whittier College experience, right? There's so much opportunity um, and you can add that opportunity back as a kind of a value added proposition, right? Um, you know, if you, if you go to, to, to presenters and plays and take advantage of the, the faculty houses, shoot, maybe you're, you're going to, you know, get a, get much more, out of the Whittier College experience than you would if you just simply come in and take your classes. Right, right, right. And I think that's especially important for commuter students. We have to really remember to, to make sure that they're getting that advantage as well. Um, right. And I, I actually say that really directly, like, you know, don't leave this on the table, you know, get everything you're, get every, get all the advantage you can out of this right. time, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's hard to imagine that about a half an hour has already gone by. But oh, yeah, um, yeah. It, this, is the, this is also one of the great things about this is um, when we did this last week, you know, we, we were sitting here talking for about 40 minutes and I was mindful because I knew some people had other places to go. And I think I had a meeting at, at right after we were finished and um, I just wanted to make sure I got everybody to where they needed to go. And mm -hmm. the time just flies because we're talking about, we're talking about the students. We're talking about our jobs. We're talking about this real special place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now we really miss it, right? We miss mm -hmm. kind of what it means to us. Um, I love, I love that I got, that I had the chance to see you today and get to talk with you. So it's been, mm -hmm. thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. And, and I just want to say one other thing if you don't mind. Um, I also just want, you asked me about things that don't work. And Yo, I, yes, let's talk, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I figure, you know, one thing, first of all, that I like to do is share my own failures because it, mm -hmm. it makes it more comfortable for other people because I've failed often, <laughs> you know. Um, so one thing that I really am aware of, increasingly aware of is, um, and this is, I think, particularly true with our students now, right now, is that they are given to, uh, or many of them will, um, will, will do a lot of personal self-disclosure. Um, in office hours, certainly, um, but even in the classroom. And um, that is something that I am increasingly careful about um, because uh, sometimes they will then have a reaction later on and feel like, uncomfortable because of that self-disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I used to, um, I, I become very careful in how I frame assignments and how I invite those kinds of things. And of course, I wanna be careful never to respond that somebody's self-disclosure is wrong or mistaken. 
that's, um, but I do, I am very careful to always make it clear to them about their choices. Um, and I think that's something about the social media generation is that, you know, this sort of helping them develop those boundaries in terms of what's, you know, what's appropriate in a particular setting or part of a particular discourse community um, so that they don't have regrets later on. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, more and more, you'll, you'll see students that they, they don't understand when the mentoring begins and the advising ends or the teaching. They, they blur the lines really, really fast. And um, it could be easy for you to get into a real delicate situation that then suddenly you have to moderate or mediate or, or do something that, you know, mm -hmm. involves getting other parties uh, into the conversation. And, and you, know, you just want to, I agree, have those boundaries, have clearly defined what the role is. And, um, mm -hmm. and it, it's easy to blur the lines, I think. It's easy for the students to do it, right? They, they, they don't know uh, this is their first time being an adult, right? They're, and you don't get to practice. You don't get to practice, right? They're right. practicing on us, so, yeah. um, so it's our job to to help them with that. Yeah. Well, anything else that you want to add? Anything? I, I think that's it. I think that um, Whittier is a great place to teach. I love it. I've taught here for years, and I think it is exciting. Every single semester, I learn something totally different and new that I did not expect. So if you're, you know, if this is going out to people who are new to Whittier, welcome. This is a great place to be. Yeah. Thank you so much.